Does our system stop that, Lee? David? I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, who knows? I don't know. I don't think there is a system to stop it because it'd be just like me getting on there. If we, if, if somebody gets a hold of the invite, which it's, I, we tweeted it out there. So it's, it's out there. Sure. It could be just somebody like me that's on there, not, not showing their face and could, uh, could potentially ask some strange questions or get rude with it. Just so a little bit of a beware there. So, okay. Okay, well, I think we can probably get started. Okay. Uh, thank everybody for coming today. And I won't waste any time. I'll just let Jay take the floor. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for, for participating in this. Um, did it on Tuesday, and it worked very well. Uh, I was real pleased with uh, the results and the questions that came. Um, for those of you who don't know who we are, we're a family owned business out of McCook, Nebraska. We've got seven manufacturing sites around the Midwest from Indiana uh, all the way to Rapid City, South Dakota and Rapid City services all of the uh, three prairie provinces in Canada. We'll get right into it. We're gonna talk about foliar feeding. We'll leave the starter part of it out. Uh, Courtney asked that we keep this to about an hour. Uh, it went over a bit on Tuesday. But please, if something is eating at you and you don't understand something or you want clarification, chime in and ask questions. We've got a couple guys on here who have used uh, our products in the past successfully and um, <coughs> I've asked them to chime in when necessary or when they think it's the right time to do it. And, kind of uh, reinforce what we're saying as well here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these big world records um, and how that did by foliar feeding. Here's uh, David Hula, actually he's in the 600 plus range now. Uh, for that, This was uh, 2018 and 2019, he's above 600. Uh, for corn, uh, soy beans was uh, dowdy. Uh, actually at 190 plus uh, soybean bushels right now. Um, these guys have figured out how to do it. Now they don't do it on a huge scale. Uh, these are these are essentially test plots. Some are as are 10 foot by 60 foot. Some of them are full quarter sections. Uh, so um, uh, we're not suggesting that you fertility program that it takes to grow this kind of thing, but Common element, here's peas that were grown up in Canada, 94 bushels, uh, 50 bushels in England for, uh, for wheat, uh, 116 bushels for canola in uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, uh, the point is, is that these guys foliar fed multiple times in order to achieve these yields. Uh, pro uh, without foliar feeding, they didn't even get close. That's the key element. Foliar feeding is a strategy that when done at the right time with the right types of products, it's going to end up giving you a benefit in the end. So fertilizers uh, are also um, somewhat dependent on some of the new genetics that have come out in the last 25 or 30 years. And we'll get into that. Now this is Disclaimer, more or less, foliar applications cannot by themselves meet the total nutrient demand of a crop. There are those out there that will say that it will. Well, that's just not true. Um, foliar feeding works in two different ways. Number one, it actually does absorb nutrients to the leaf, especially nitrogen, which increases the chlorophyll concentration on the leaf, which then increases the ultimate water uptake by the plant where all your soil borne nutrients are dissolved. It, one cannot work without the other. You've got to have that green up as you get it. In the world, increasing the, um, the chlorophyll concentration on the leaf and then the water uptake. We'll get into that a little bit further. Your feed, well, there are inherent nutrient uh, inefficiencies, one would be for physical would be soil compaction. 
you just don't get the root growth where the uh, where the nutrients exist. Chemical would be pH uh, extremes at very low pHs, uh, below five. You're tying up phosphorus in your soil uh, via a process called illumination uh, with aluminum, and uh, iron also ties up. Uh, quite a lot of phosphorus at low pHs. At high pHs, you're tying up calcium. Um, and as most of you know, calcium phosphate is 100% insoluble. And, and your, your nutrients must be soluble in water in order for the plant roots to recognize it as a, either a, an immediate uh, fertility or with time, uh, but at least it allows it into the selectively permeable membrane on those on those roots. So, um, biological would be in your cold soils up there. Uh, you, the biology of the soil, the microbes, the bacteria, um, even as far as the uh, uh, nematodes, don't have the kind of motility that they have in warmer soils. And, uh, foliar feeding can help to overcome those issues. It's not new. It's documented as early as 1844. Um, there's a lot of advanced application equipment out there. And of course, today we have advanced crop genetics started in part when Monsanto started uh, changing crop genetics to be Roundup ready, uh, to be able to uh, to accommodate uh, very harsh uh, herbicides by the introduction introduction of the uh, BT gene, <clears throat> and it's since just just flourished. This is an example of that, and I'll grant you it's on corn, but this is the same as any other crop with the BT gene. Uh, on the left, you'll see a uh, a conventional source of corn. Uh, with, res with respect to nitrogen uptake. On the right, you'll see Roundup Ready. Look at the difference there. At uh, right around R6, R7, or R5, R6, the uh, conventional source isn't taking up any additional nitrogen. On the right, it's taking up nitrogen to the point that you're firing a issue there. Here's phosphorus uptake. It looks about the same on the left as the nitrogen did on the right. Look at the slope of that line. I mean, it's incredibly high. And what you're doing is you're taking up nutrients uh, at the time that you're fire, uh, firing your combine up. And that says that that plant at that stage with those genetics is demanding more phosphorus, which means it's demanding more energy at that stage. We found this to be true, late season application of nitrogen, nitrogen, potassium, sulfur, and phosphorus can increase your yield by as much as 30%. Uh, now you're not gonna put more ears of corn on and you're not gonna put more uh, kernels on that cob. What you're doing is increasing weight at that stage and you get paid for that. This is the most dramatic one, it's potassium on corn. Halfway through the growing season, it's just not taking any more potassium up. And you can see the one on the right where the genetics have changed and it's taking up nitri or, uh, potassium uh, right at the point that you're firing your combine up. This is not only in Roundup Ready genetics. This is genetics in general since that gene, like Jay said, has been introduced. So you people that grow conventional canola or flax or whatever the case may be, it doesn't make any difference if it's Roundup ready or not. Those genes through technology in developing seed, they have put those, this type of performance into those seeds. I just want to stop for a second. I just had to mute everybody. So if you have any questions, you'll have to unmute yourself before, in case you're wondering why it won't come through. Just, we were getting a little bit of feedback from the noise. Thanks for doing that. No worries. Okay, foliar nutrients are mobilized directly into the plant leaves. It's extremely efficient. What you're doing is you're 
increasing the rate of photosynthesis, increasing the concentration of chlorophyll on the leaf. Look at chlorophyll concentration on the leaf in terms of uh, it acting almost as a uh, a block. It won't allow that photon from the sun that slams into that leaf goes right, it's small enough to go right through that chlorophyll concentration, slams into the chloroplast, uh, starts the process of photosynthesis, the release of energy via the release of phosphate, uh, adenosine triphosphate to diphosphate. It's releasing an oxygen atom from the phosphate functionality and the photosynthesis process begins. Uh, from that stage, if you can trap that photon for a nanosecond longer, you have dramatically increased the rate of photosynthesis. And the chemical reaction associated with photosynthesis is water plus carbon dioxide yields sugar plus oxygen. Water is a, is a critical part of the photosynthetic process. If you can increase water uptake in that plant, where all of your nutrients are dissolved, you can increase your yield. And that's the value of foliar feeding. You are directly foliar feeding through the polar cuticular pores in the leaf. You're forming a higher rate of chlorophyll on the leaf. You're increasing the rate of photosynthesis. You increase the biomass, which is more leaves, larger leaves, and that engine just keeps going over and over and over again. It's just a beautiful circle. Like this, how foliar nitrogen works. You increase your chlorophyll concentration, photosynthesis rate increases, you trap that photon for a nanosecond longer, keeping in mind that there are a trillion trillion photons hitting that corn leaf at the same second. Now, most of them bounce off, and that's why we see color. But uh, that, 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 that process of, of, uh, of light refraction is uh, why we see color. But enough get in, to, uh, in to, to affect the photosynthesis process. With that, you increase water and soil nutrient uptake, and you get a biomass increase. And that circle continues from the time of emergence the genetics in that plant tell you it's time to uh, to harvest. People, if you, this is the most important. Yep. There, there's two things that are important in this whole thing. And this, this is the first one. And it is not the, the amount of nutrients you put on the leaf. It is the nutrients that you put on there is is direct relationship with chlorophyll production and photosynthesis to make the plant leaves bigger and greener to collect more sunlight to take up more water from the soil solution which all your nutrients are there in that water solution you've got to understand this because if if you if you think that three pounds of nitrogen is going to do you any good it's not it's, it is the chlorophyll photosynthesis process that makes this foliar deal work. And there's and a lot of matter. people out there that don't understand that. Yeah, and it doesn't matter what product you're using. If you've got a good source of foliar nutrition, this is the way that it works. And unfortunately, there's a lot of um, out there at the university level who are somewhat blind to this entire process. You've just Look at the chemistry of photosynthesis and it barks right back at you at how this works on a, a chemistry and a biological physics level. Top dress is not foliar. If you go out to top dress 28% on your wheat, that is not foliar feeding. You do have a urea functionality in there which might give you a little bit of absorption through the loof leaf, but the other half of that that mix is ammonium nitrate. If you take straight ammonium nitrate and you dump it on your, on your field, number one, you're gonna burn your leaves, and number two, you're, you're just not gonna get any feeding whatsoever. It's a pure salt. Salt 
don't foliar feed, which is why we have never and will never recommend our starter fertilizers as foliar mechanisms. And they are in conjunction with a good foliar product like our KQXRN. Effective foliar products feed through the waxy cuticular layer of the leaf. They stimulate photosynthesis, increase chlorophyll, on and on. Green leaf, positive foliar. And low salt starters, salts in general. Humic acids are very poor foliar mechanisms. Lignosulfonates, the molecule is gigantic and is never going to be absorbed through the polar cuticular. Chloroplast. We've talked about that. That's where photosynthesis is initiated. Number two is the stomata. That's your expiration and respiration. There is no foliar feeding going through the stomata. I've heard this many times from university professors, and uh, they don't appreciate it when I challenge them on it, but it just doesn't happen. The only absorption occurs through a polar cuticular pore. At the relative size of those, the stomata is an Olympic-sized swimming pool. The polar cuticular pore is a 55-gallon drum, and the uh, chloroplast is a 5-gallon drum. Those are the relative sizes as you look at it, and you've got to be a nanometer in size, a billionth of a meter, in order to positively foliar feed through that leaf via the polar cuticular pathways. So this is what you need for a good quality foliar product. It's got to be non-ionic. You can't have no a, a net molecular charge. The reason why um, something like our starter fertilizers, which are relatively non-polar, won't foliar feed well is because there is a net molecular charge on it. Polar cuticular pore is positively charged. If you have another species that has a net positive charge on it, it's never going to foliar feed. Nonpolar means an even distribution of electrons on the molecule. An uneven distribution of electrons would be something as simple as water. At the point on the balloon where you tie, tie a to keep the air from escaping. That's where the two hydrogens uh, reside. And they, they have two, uh, each one has one electron. The oxygen associated with that has 16 electrons. And so if you just take a look at that balloon, you have a gross uneven distribution of electrons. And that's why water doesn't go through those polar cuticular pathways because it can't get in. It's a polar molecule. Think about it. Polar cuticular pore, polar molecule. It's like trying to put two magnets together. They're going to resist, and most of that water just flows off of that leaf onto the ground. Organic molecules need to be present. Organic, not organic farming, but the study of carbon is organic chemistry. And Organic molecules, carbon must be present, and it's got to be in a soluble form. It's got a carbonyl group. It's got to be in a carboxylic acid group. It's got to be in a, an aldehyde functionality, something that's easy, something that's simple uh, in terms of a hydrocarbon that can absorb through the leaf. And nitrogen, which is the most important of all of them, has to be present. What we have found is that if you've got some urea in there, or a majority of your urea in there, what you have is a good foliar mechanism. The nitrogen, urea, and organic molecules uh, bleed into, they affect the non-polarity and the non-ionicity of that molecule. Here's some data from uh, Purdue University uh, which indicates that nitrogen as urea by itself is 50% absorbed into the leaf in a half an hour to two hours. Within 18 hours, it's generally 100% uh, absorbed into the leaf and translocated all the way to the root system. That's a significant point. It's fast. It's very fast. 
The only problem with straight nitrogen dissolved in water is that it's, uh, it burns your plants. You can read the rest of them on this slide. Nothing is as fast and nothing is as efficient as this. And um, our products are, all of our foliar products are entirely based on urea. Our mother and father of all of our products is our KQXRN, which stands for Kugler Quality Extended Release Nitrogen. It's 65% urea. You couldn't get that much into a saturated water solution if you tried. The reason we can do that is that when you get that product, it's 100% polymerized. It's a polymer that's very high molecular weight and uh, very cross-linked. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but urea is the key to quality foliar products. There's the uh, chemical structure of urea. Look at that oxygen. That's got 16 electrons floating around of it. You look at those two nitrogens, offset the two hydrogens, and you've almost got the same number. You have a carbon that doesn't have any free electrons because they're all tied up. Every carbon molecule has to have four bonds in order for it to react with something. And as you see, it's got four bonds there. This is nonpolar. There's no net charge on it. It's non-ionic. It contains carbon in the carbonyl functionality, and it also contains nitrogen. It has everything in it that a good foliar product needs. Now, this is a busy but effective slide showing what a single molecular unit of KQXRN looks like. Can you guys see the cursor moving around? I'm not okay. doing anything. No, that's me. I'm just asking if you can see it. Oh, yeah, I can see it. There's a urea molecule. There's part of a urea molecule that's in the process of forming the triazone. Another urea molecule, another one, another one, another one, another one, another one. As you can see, urea is the majority component of our product, but they're all attached together. They're not floating around singularly in, that, in a water matrix. When you get the KQXRN in a, in a tank truck or a, a shuttle, it's 100% polymer. There's no water in it whatsoever. That's the beauty of it. This is where, this is called a methylol linkage, methylol linkage, methylol linkage. And this six membered ring, after we put all the urea in our reactor and we, re, and we polymerized all this stuff, we had a whole bunch of anhydrous ammonia in there, which is the NH. That begins the process of forming this triazone ring. The product is called a polymethylene urea triazone. The urea, this functionality right here, is called a methylol urea functionality. It is the slow release portion of it, again, Kugler quality extended release nitrogen, that slow releases from time zero to time three weeks. Over here, with these three nitrogens on it, is very complex. Longer for it to break down in the presence of ultraviolet light in order for those, uh, those nitrogen functionalities to become available to absorb through that plant leaf. Got any questions about this, don't hesitate to ask. This is also considered a very highly cross-linked polymer. Look at this in terms of two dimensions, that's what you're seeing right now. Twist this thing into three dimensions, keeping in mind that you've got electrons banging into other electrons, and this whole thing looks like a jumbled mess, and we refer to it as the fishnet. And a crosslink polymer, if you take the, the fishnet itself and you ball it up into something, let's just say for sake of argument, the size of a, a baseball. Wherever one strand on that fishnet touches another one is a chemical bond. The, the concept of cross-linking. The sunlight hits this functionality right here, that carbon double bond oxygen. It is particularly susceptible for, to ultraviolet attack. It breaks that bond. Once the bond breaks, it releases those two nitrogens. 
But if that one breaks, it releases those two nitrogens and on and on and on, layer by layer by layer, until you reach the point where there's no other layers for the sun to hit. This is not the same as photosynthesis. This is an ultraviolet, is ultraviolet radiation. This is not a photon hitting the leaf. Photon is a particle. Ultraviolet is radiation. There is a difference between the two. If you've got any questions about this, either now or later, please don't hesitate to contact us. Well, the isotope study showed, and this is uh, relative to some work that was done with Michigan State University. They actually applied some urea to a cotton plant back in 1952 to see uh, what would happen. Would that urea uh, and the and the other sources of nutrients absorb into that plant. And in fact, the radioisotope that was attached to each one of those molecular structures could be followed throughout the plant. This is where they found that the urea absorbed 100% within 18 hours. Going back to this slide, you gotta think in terms of this being this zone ring formation is slow release from time zero to time six weeks. Methyl all urea functionality is uh, slow release from time zero to time uh, three weeks. Now let's just take a pair of scissors and start cutting the outside of that ball that we've just uh, wadded up. Start cutting little pieces. This one right here. That's called an oligomer. That's a single polymer unit that makes up all the rest of this. There's 28% in that mix floating around that looks like this, which immediately goes into that plant leaf. As soon as you apply it, it immediately starts to, to absorb through those polar cuticular pathways. And whatever you put with this whole polymeric unit will be carried in at that same rate means this one's going to be carried in and 100 percent absorbed because it's of a size that can go into that leaf structure it's going to immediately absorb so you put a herbicide with it you put a fungicide with it it's going to take it in at exactly the same rate that this one's going to go in because of this urea functionality now where those isotope studies showed that it was eight to ten times more effective to foliar feed Further university studies have found figure to be between six and a hundred times more effective based on the nutrient that you're using. Uh, this is a very important slide, but there has to be a uh, qualifier here. We're saying on this slide, or not us, this is the University of California at Davis, one pound of foliar nitrogen on a leaf in the right form, keeping in mind via the photosynthesis effect, is equivalent to four to 12 pounds in the soil. Number one, it's directly foliar feeding through the leaf, but it's also stimulating that plant to take up more water and in that process, taking up more nutrients from the soil. Phosphorus is one in 20. One pound on the leaf is equivalent to 20. And you can read the rest of these down here. Micronutrients are extremely efficient on a foliar basis. Um, and, if, and in fact, if your micronutrients are EDTA chelated, they are already in a form that can directly foliar feed into that plant. There's just nothing to stick them onto the leaf. That's part of the uh, importance because our product is extremely sticky. And it stays that way. It doesn't cure on the leaf. It stays very sticky and it becomes rain fast in an hour. Hey, Jay. Yes. Go back to that one. Now, you all need to understand this because that, this is very important here. It's not that we're saying one pound of nitrogen is equal to, so say, 10 pounds in the soil. We're not saying that. You, you have to re remember that it has to do with photosynthesis. So if you spray your, the nitrogen on the leaf and there's three pounds of nitrogen in that gallon, that will increase the uptake over and above what you all, what you put in the soil. It will increase that uptake of that nitrogen in that ratio. So it's not that you have you can cut back 
It's just increasing what is already there, taking it up in the soil. Are, are we clear with that, everybody? I mean, I know you're all on mute, but I just we just need to be very clear on that because there's there's companies out there that will say, you use our product, you spray one pound of nitrogen foliar, you're going to get five or 10 or 15 pounds return so you can cut back on your nitrogen. That's not really the case here, okay? Correct, Jay? Yeah, that's exactly right. And keep in mind that if you were to take a look at the chlorophyll molecule, you would see a central magnesium ion attached to four nitrogens, which are then attached to a series of uh, aliphatic and aromatic uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, the fact that that nitrogen is put on that leaf and is absorbed immediately is the reason why chlorophyll is created so efficiently after foliar feeding occurs. The nitrogen is absorbed into the leaf and chemical processes within that leaf and within that plant those complex nitrogen containing components down and rebuild them into that chlorophyll molecule. That's why micronutrients are so important. Uh, calcium, uh, or excuse me, magnesium, which is in the center of that whole process, is critical. Without it, without enough uh, magnesium in the soil, or uh, you could foliar feed it too as a micronutrient, you're just not going to get the formation of chlorophyll that you need. Foliar fertility is the most effective way to apply micronutrients. I just said that EDTA, ethylene, diamine, tetraacetic acid uh, functionalities are already in a form that can be absorbed directly into the plant leaf. They're of a, the molecular size is compatible. They, they are nonpolar, non-ionic. They all contain nitrogen. They all contain carbon. Ethylene, carbon, carbon, diamine, two amine groups, tetraacetic acid is all uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Um, it has everything that's necessary to foliar feed. Again, there's just nothing sticking it onto the leaf. And that's where applying it with a slow release nitrogen is very critical. Micronutrients 101, it's just emphasis on that one because in our experience, micros always win. There always seems to be a micronutrient shortage. Um, we would rather see you put micros in at planting time because that's when the plant can utilize it the most effectively. But if you can't do that or if you run into uh, uh, in-crop difficulties, uh, yellowing, uh, of the plant leaves, uh, if you put too much Roundup on many plant species, it results in a yellow flash. You can apply the appropriate micronutrient in order to bring that crop back. If you have yellowing because you have shortages of micronutrients, you have lost photosynthesis in that area, in that square footage, uh, or, or that, that unit of area on that leaf. And there's no way you're going to get the same results if, if you had it green all the time. Uh, boron, sugar production. Remember the chemical reaction. Water plus carbon dioxide yields sugar plus oxygen. Sugar is an intrinsic part of that chemical reaction and boron feeds into it. Copper is to help ensure successful protein synthesis, which is a direct function of photosynthesis. Come on now. Iron, nitrogen reduction and fi fixation, um, direct function of photosynthesis. Manganese is one of the most important. It plays a direct role in phot photosynthesis in conjunction with chloride. Uh, in, situ, in the plant leaf, uh, organic chloride hydroxide is formed, which is critical to that plant, which is why chloride is critical to every single species of plant, because without it, Photosynthesis just simply doesn't occur. It lasts for long. Uh, it's formed. It's a, um, for the lack of a better uh, analogy, it's a uh, 
process that occurs that breaks down very quickly, but it's the pathway to other chemical reactions occurring. Calcium, nitrogen metabolism, important micronutrients. Magnesium, critical in chlorophyll production. Chlorine, again, uh, intrinsic component of photosynthesis, among other things. It's next necessary for chlorophyll production. And molybdenum is the only one that's not completely directly related to um, photosynthesis, but if you're taking up nitrogen uh, through the soil especially, it's necessary for the nitrate reductase process. You know, if you, uh, if you have a nitrate in your soil, it will go into your plant root, but it's still not a nutrient. By a process called nitrate reductase, it's breaking down from nitrate, NO3, into NO2, nitrite, then into NO, then into NH. Now when it gets to the ammoniacal form, the plant says, boy, I got something I can chew on here. So there are hundreds of millions of chemical reactions occurring every nanosecond in that plant. And that's why micronutrients are so important. We talk about our micronutrients EDTA chelated. If you read a label on a starter fertilizer or on a micronutrient that just simply says it's iron sulfate, copper sulfate, manganese sulfate, it's not a micronutrient. It's got to be broken down in the soil and it is never going to be absorbed by the plant leaf. Because why? There's no carbon in it. Let's just take magnesium sulfate, this beast down here. You see any carbon in that? This one has a net charge on it, so it's an ionic molecule. You see, if it's an ionic molecule, almost by definition, it's also polar. And there's no nitrogen in this molecular structure. Yet, you read the labels on some of these guys that are supplying this stuff, and they're saying on a regular basis, you can foliar feed this. No, you can't never going to go in. So any salt, salt, especially a sulfate salt, is the absolute worst uh, chelating agent. Ours are all EDTA or EDTA chelated. This is just another form right here for iron. It's plus two uh, ion versus the plus three ion. Uh, the most efficient forms of these chelates are these three. So you deliver the micronutrients in the soil and foliar this way. Uh, first type of micronutrient is a salt. Lignosulfonates are the next worst. Flavonoids are somewhere in the, begin in the middle. They're not too bad. Citric acid is okay. Does not do as good a job as EDTA. And so keep that in mind when you're looking at labels because it, uh, it, it's critical that you can uh, Hold on to that ion. Chelate means in Greek claw. And so it's grabbing on to that ion as it's ionized in a liquid solution. You put copper sulfate in a liquid solution. You don't have a copper sulfate molecule in there. You have copper plus two and you have sulfate minus two. They're floating around independently of each other wants to grab onto something. That sulfate wants to grab onto something. And so we introduce EDTA in that mix and enough of those copper ions are grabbed onto by that EDTA, but they do not react with it. They are absorbed by the plant root. They are absorbed through the plant cuticular pathways and they're broken down inside of the plant via other chemical and enzymatic processes. And when it occurs, you release that copper ion doesn't get a chance to tie up with something in the soil. That's the value of a good keelant. For best results, it should contain nitrogen. Uh, most studied foliar product is nitrogen. Uh, depending on the species, it's somewhere between 30 and 99% foliar absorbed. This is our product, KQXRN. It's 28% nitrogen. Of that whole blend, 72% of it is slow-release nitrogen. It's in that form that you saw on that slide that had all of those uh, 
polymers and oligomers floating around in there. So 72% of that slow release nitrogen is a polymer, very high molecular weight. There's 150,000 of those molecular units in every polymer unit. And there are hundreds of millions of those polymer units in uh, a gallon of product. 28% of that whole mix are oligomers and those oligomers are immediately absorbed where the other 72% is broken down over time via ultraviolet light. I hope that makes sense to everyone because it's the fact that they are, they are tied up in that polymeric form. That's also the reason that this product does not burn. Take your, take your uh, sprayer into the field. Neat material, no water added to it. Start spraying. Stop. Continue to, to spray for 10 minutes on the same leaves. Then go away. Come back the next day and you will see absolutely no burn whatsoever, even though it's 28% nitrogen. And any comments on that, guys? Okay. These are our products. The KQXRN is the mother and father of all of our foliar products. The KS2075 is 20% KQXRN blended with 7.5% potassium and 5% sulfur, also in a non-burning form. This is one of our favorite products because you're delivering three nutrients versus just one. The KQXRN2530 was designed to increase protein in cereals. Uh, it contains KQXRN, but it also contains a couple of other components. Uh, we don't do trials on using this product anymore for protein because we've only had one instance where we didn't see an increase. Every other one we saw somewhere between a half a point all the way to eight points. And so average is two to two and a half points protein increase by using this product. 1022 is a foliar product that contains phosphorus and potassium. The 10% nitrogen has is carrying with it 30% uh, uh, slow release nitrogen. It can also be used as a uh, as a starter fertilizer. 1022 is that 14% nitrogen has 40% slow release in it. 10% phosphorus and 2% potassium. Our 178C is the mother and father of our chloride-containing products. This one is primarily used for uh, resistance in plants. And our KS Maximum in, is, is uh, a Canadian product. That's our micronutrient package. 2% zinc, 2% manganese, 1% iron, a half copper, and 0.25% boron. Again, all in the EDTA form. Here's foliar nitrogen. This is just taking urea and dissolving it in water and spraying it at five gallons an acre rate. You can see the results. You're burning it. Uh, that will recover. Now, those leaves will never recover, but you'll get new growth. This is done at about V4, V5 stage, where uh, this is where you would normally go out to kill your weeds with uh, an in-crop uh, herbicide. Here is KQXRN, same rate, same day, same field. Just doesn't burn your fields and it's really shiny like that. I mean you can tell where you've sprayed within a couple of minutes. Um, that's the beauty of it. Number one, it doesn't burn. Number two, it delivers foliar nitrogen into your plant and in most cases at this stage they're putting a herbicide with it. Think about it for a second. You get a herbicide. If you carry it in that much faster and feed your crop at the same time, you've got yourself something that's going to give you some benefit. Uh, at this stage, you want to use far less than if you would at the transition between vegetative and reproductive because you got fewer leaves out. Uh, by the time V10 to VT on corn comes about, you have a complete canopy. In this stage, you may use a half a gallon. At the other state, at transition, you might use two gallons of product because you have that much more biomass out. Here's one gallon of our KS2075 sprayed on peas. This was done in North Dakota. 
And you can see around the entire field, the dark all the way around was sprayed. In this particular area, one gallon of the 2075 did exactly what it was designed to do. It increased chlorophyll on the leaf. Obviously by the six bushel increase, it increased that rate of photosynthesis, the water uptake from the soil, and the increase in biomass. And that's just a single gallon of product. And at, at the time, peas were running right around 10 bushels an acre. Uh, when he paid for the product, he put some money in his pocket. It's also very compatible with most insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. It is truly really a perfect delivery system. Um, we have, or at least I have a listing of those herbicides and fungicides that uh, I've been asked, are they compatible with our product? Uh, if you got a question, just ask. Uh, give me a call. I'll look at the chemical structure and within a couple of seconds, I'll be able to tell you whether or not it's going to be compatible or not. Uh, we do have a request when you're mixing our product with other chemicals. Number one, mix your chemical and your water first. Make sure a good dispersion in there because there are some of the herbicides and fungicides that have an oil-based component and if you get good agitation you get an oil slick on the surface then you add the whatever amount of the fertilizer that you're going to use and in our case it's somewhere between a half a gallon and a gallon allowing weed size to be your guide larger the weeds the greater the amount of the slow release nitrogen you put in. Smaller the weeds, the less you put in. And always do a jar test if you got a question as well. It's non corrosive. As you can see, 21511 KQXRN with a nail in it has been put in that, uh, that, that jug and it's just not doing anything. Same thing with the 2075, not been in there quite as long, but we're talking six years there. We open this and we insult it with oxygen frequently because oxygen is a, an intrinsic component of uh, corrosion. Look at what 32% will do. That's UAN, urea and ammonium nitrate. It slows it down. Straight 32%. Is there still a, a nail in there? A part of one? No, a little bit. It's right here. You can see that you can shake it around, you can feel there's something in there, but it's not like it was. And these two have been around forever and we show them all the time. So it's just not going to corrode your, your equipment at all. That's why flyers like it. Uh, it's 28% nitrogen. If you ask them to fly with uh, UAN, they wouldn't do it. This stuff does not harm their equipment in any capacity at all. Lee? This is uh, up south of Regina, I believe. This is where we took this. Uh, uh, we was out there and, and the guy sprayed. We come back the next day and took pictures. Uh, here's herbicide alone. You can see there's not a lot of activity going on. Next slide is uh, XRN herbicide. You can see a little difference. These were side by side. Um, the silver of the leaves and here is XRN. Uh, with uh, 48 hours difference, and that's Canadian thistles, what that is. So, like Jay said, you know, it's, it's not that, uh, in, in my belief, it's not that it's making the chemical any stronger. What I believe happens is that the XRN has that sticking ability, and, and when, it, when you spray it on with a herbicide, it lasts on that leaf longer. So, the plant ability to take up more chemical at a longer period of time, you get more activity into that plant. So uh, in versus spraying it on with water where it runs off onto the ground or whatever. Uh, so that plant is taking more of that product in. Here it is again on pre-burn. This was, uh, of course, uh, XRN on the uh, left and then uh, without it. And la like Jay says, uh, you know, you can even go down to a quart. If, if you've got weeds that's two or three inches tall, 
that type of thing. You can run down to a court with, uh, with some of your herbicides. Uh, if they get past two or three inches, then I recommend going up to a half a gallon. And, uh, and if they get bigger than that, then you need to go up to a gallon. Just to look in terms of timing, this side here, which contained the KQXRM was two days. In order for this side to get to this point with uh, herbicide alone took eight days. So it's doing exactly what it's designed to do, acting as a carrier. We need to need to run around. Uh, you know, I wouldn't. I I don't run hardly anything less than ten gallon most of the time. Seven's okay, but uh, ten gallon run about forty pounds of pressure. Get you a good fog going back there, so it coats both the top and the bottoms of those leaves. You get some on on all that plant, uh, and you'll have better better weed kill. <coughs> Go ahead. Oh, this is the XRN. Uh, this is right after application. You can see the shininess on the leaf uh, there on the corn leaf. Uh, the next slide is, uh, I believe it's 48 hours in that chalky material. <clears throat> it's something like, um, oh, let's say asphalt. Uh, you know, you put black asphalt down. After about a year, it starts to fade and it gets that grayish tint or whatever to it. That's the polymers breaking down. That's exactly what's happening here. Uh, those polymers are breaking down and here it is uh, 72 hours after afterwards. You can still see residue. It's about gone by then as far as sign on the leaf, but it's still there remaining. And, and so relate that back to your weed deal. Okay, so you've got the herbicide and that this is a weed leaf, let's say. So 72 hours, you're still seeing residual on that leaf. You're still seeing activity with that herbicide going into that weed 72 hours after you sprayed it. Now you do need some kind of a mo mobility factor in there. So water is necessary to mobilize that, those nutrients uh, evenly around that plant leaf. Um, you need atmospheric water, you need dew in the morning, rain will do the same thing, uh, but it just can't sit there. Nothing's going to happen to the plant, it's not going to burn it or anything, but in order to get effective use out of it, you've got you've to move it around with water. There's, and there's a couple things that we probably need to add right here now. Uh, crop oil, do not use uh, concentrate crop oil with it. Uh, and do not use uh, surfactant. Yeah, surfactants. So there's a surfactant maybe tell them about the about the fix deal, Jay. I, I you know it's a water conditioner. Six years ago, we ran into someone who was claiming that our product was was burning his plant. Well, we got there, and there clearly was spotting. There was uh, there was leaf damage. Um, millions of gallons that we've sold, we've never had a single complaint of any burn whatsoever. And Lee and I believe in this, uh, this concept of there is always the rest of the story. And as we're wandering around, we asked him what else he put on, and he showed us a, um, a label from a product by Omex called Fix, P-H-I-X. They utilize that product to change the pH of water, uh, thinking that that's going to be, uh, that's going to give them some benefit when they're spraying uh, foliar on their plants. Well, it doesn't because PHIX is made of, and this is real catchy, carbamate dihydrogen sulfate. Carbamate is just another name for urea. Uh, it's a carbamate functionality. Dihydrogen, H2. Sulfate, SO4. Sulfuric acid. You're putting sulfuric acid, which is going to burn your plant in the first place, with something that's gonna stick it for a month on your plant leaf. Make sure what you're using. And if you got a question, just ask. I can tell you within a couple of minutes what's gonna happen, whether it's good or a bad uh, blend of things that you're putting together, but never use fix, ever. Because it has its own force, form of surfactant in it. And KQXRN uh, has surfactant capability. Uh, the word surfactant is an anagram for surface active agent. And what it does is it reduces the uh, surface tension of water 
making water more wettable means it spreads it out over that leaf better. We've got our own surfactant in there. We don't need another surfactant put in with it. And that right there, that picture right there tells the where it's at. Each one of those white spots on that leaf, that was a drop. And look at the way it spreads that, that product out. You can, you can see it active right there. Those aren't several drops together. There's another one. Look at the way that that, it, it, just like Jay said, it's a surfactant and, and it makes water more wettable so it spreads that product out on the leaf. <clears throat> Best timing for foliar applications is the uh, transition between vegetative and reproductive. On um, cereals, that would be right about flag leaf. Uh, on corn, that would be between V10 and VT. Uh, on canola, that would be right around 20% into flower, or any flowering species similar to, to canola uh, would be 20% into flower. Um, that's where that plant is absorbing more nutrients from the ground than it can actually physically take up. The ability of that plant to absorb nutrients at this stage from the ground is inversely proportional to the availability. Think about that statement for a while. It can't take up enough to meet its nutrient demand. So why not help it to do that? Increasing chlorophyll, by increasing the rate of photosynthesis, by increasing water uptake into the plant, and by creating more biomass at that stage. This is, granted, not a lot of corn grown up in, uh, in Canada, but this is an example of that stage. Tassel is maximum vegetative state, and it's beginning to transfer to the reproductive stage. You're taking 13 pounds of nitrogen per acre per day for 11 days or excuse me, uh, 13 days, 11.1 .1 pounds of nitrogen per acre per day. It's a huge amount of product that's being taken up by that, by that corn leaf. Off seed, which is soybeans, it's taking up for 21 days, 11.4 pounds of nitrogen per acre per day. You can't feed that plant enough at this stage. That's where foliar feeding comes into play. Here's canola. This came right from your canola council up there. That elongation to full flower is transition from vegetative to reproductive. You're taking up the majority of your nutrients per acre per day uh, here. Uh, the other interesting thing that we found was that canola in particular is extremely high demand for phosphorus in the last two stages of growth. And what we found is that if you foliar feed phos at these stages, you're not going to increase the number of pods. I can increase the number of seeds in those pods, but what you are going to do is increase the weight. And your growers get paid for this. And we've got data to prove that. Lee's going to talk about the results. Lee's the person in our organization that takes care of all of the trialing protocol, uh, running these trials and taking the data and put it into a usable form for all of us out in the field. This was uh, tissue testing that we've done. There was 13 of these tissue tests done uh, up around PA. Uh, Florian had done these. <clears throat> and uh, the first pass, he put on three quarts of 624.6 uh, six with two gallon of 2075. Second pass was two gallon of XRN. And though the yield was 42 bushels. So you can see that that uh, he put on the N, P, and K, and sulfur, but there was no micronutrients uh, involved in this application. So it goes back to where we say that you put that on there and it kicks that plant into second gear and it draws more nutrients in from the soil. And, and if you look at every one of those, um, other than boron, uh, boron had an increase, but not near as much as the others. Uh, so you can see that, that it is, is taking more water solution with the nutrients up from the soil once foliar is applied. Here's another one of Liberty Canola. This is over in Manitoba, uh, two gallon of 2075 and a pint of Micromax. 
uh, there was 15 bushel difference. Here's some peas. <clears throat> These brothers uh, uh, was raising uh, peas. They put on uh, 624.6 and, and maximum with some humic in furrow. Uh, come back with 2075 and maximum again. Uh, that's the micronutrients. And then 178C, which is our XRN and chloride product mixed together with a half rate of fungicide for disease control. These bees were our peas were making somewhere in that 94 to 96 range. Um, and then they had uh, a large wind come by. And uh, I believe Warren told me the other day after we did that other presentation that they averaged, ended up averaging at 64 bushel uh, is what they averaged over the whole, uh, uh, I think they got three, three or 400 acres of peas if, if I'm not mistaking. Anyway, there was about 64 bushel average after the wind. Which isn't bad, so. Uh, this is our first test on in South Dakota on winter wheat. Um, you know, I'm not going to throw, throw out here nitrogen isn't the main factor because it is. Uh, everybody knows that when nitrogen, more, the more nitrogen you apply to a wheat crop, it seems like that has the direct factor in protein and increase in protein. So <clears throat> he had a good uh, pre-plant program, a nitrogen program, a nutrient program in, in his uh, plan here. So, but he went back in with two gallon of 2530 at soft dough. And my reasoning behind doing this application when we decided to do that is normally if you have wet weather, you have yield. If you have dry weather, you have protein increase. <clears throat> and my belief was that, and still is, that when you stress that wheat crop, that's in direct relationship with, with the, the nitrogen. So if the 2530 has basically 70% of that nitrogen is quick release, I call it quick release, fast release, and the other 30% is slow release. So it, that 70% sprayed at soft dough, stresses that plant at that particular time to increase and, and, and make draw more nitrogen from the soil. And then you have the, the 30% that carries that on for the next 30 days or three weeks, basically, uh, till harvest to finish that crop out. And you can see the results there. Here's another one, <clears throat> protein on hard red winter. Uh, check uh, there was 11.2. We went with 178C twice and increased it to 13.9. We did a 178C twice and a gallon and a half of 25.30 on both of the last two there. And you can see a 14.8 and a 14.5. So we replicated the, uh, the stuff that here, the, the, the plot that we wanted to actually do with a fungicide type product uh, uh, and then the uh, 2530 uh, at the end. So um, had four gallon of, uh, of 624 and, and 525 gallon 28. So I had good fertility program to begin with like I was talking about. Here's another program that <clears throat> was out west of PA. Um, he had bought some XRN from us and uh, he sprayed it and then we was headed headed to uh, Lloydminster and we stopped by there to uh, uh, look at this field that he'd applied on. This was uh, like the second or third year that we was up there uh, and we just went out there and picked some leaves and these were the results of the leaves that we had, we'd picked. Now we get into plant health which is uh, in most cases you're talking about fungicides um, this right here is a, a short, uh, sweet representation of what our product looks like, perhaps. Here's a bio molecule. Uh, here's one, here's one, here's one. Here's a triazone functionality, six-membered ring. Here's another one over here. What we've done is, uh, when I got into about six years ago looking at the chemistry of fungicides, um, 
first of all, I was surprised at the simplicity behind it. And second of all, I was surprised that the primary active ingredient in every fungicide on the market is chloride. Now, some today contain fluoride, uh, which is just above on the periodic table where chlorine resides, um, because, but it's, it's more active, but it's also much more difficult to work with. So we decided to stay with chloride, but this is headline right here. Headline is a benzene ring with six substitutions on it, two nitrogen-based substitutions and four chlorides. This is nonpolar. There's no net charge on the molecule. Each one of these points on the six-membered ring is a carbon molecule and it contains nitrogen. It is the reason it works. A fungicide even begins to work is that it has all of the components of a good foliar product. The reason that a fungicide works is not killing fungus in the field. It doesn't kill fungal spores. It induces via foliar mechanism these little beasts in here, chloride, into the plant leaf which reside longer in the plant leaf than the other components, the carbons, the hydrogens, the oxygens like you see down here in Prasaro. It stays there longer and it protects that leaf against fungal attack. You got to look at this logically, folks. Count the number of fungal spores in an acre of Fusarium infected uh, wheat or cereal of any kind. You couldn't count the number of fungal spores in that field in the course of your lifetime. Six ounces of this is going to kill all that? It's not only irrational, it's illogical. It can't be proven mathematically. What you're doing is you're inducing chloride into that into that plant leaf via a good foliar mechanism. For sorrow is the same. It's carbon, it's got, in this case, chloride. It contains uh, nitrogen. This is your propioconazole functionality right here. It is a relatively nonpolar molecular structure and there's no net charge on it. So you've got everything that you need in these two products and these are the two primary families of fungicide. This is a strobilin and this is a propioconazole. Then there are other chemistries that are very similar to this. Each of them contains the chloride. What we've done is taken KQXRN, which is a good foliar carrier, and we've added to it a source of chloride. There's uh, over 10 times the amount of chloride in our typical application than there is versus headline. Headline has the most chloride of any fungicide on the market. And this is in a non-burning form. Um, it is meant to be for plant health. It, you induce chloride into it. You're doing a couple of things. You're inducing chloride for the process of photosynthesis, which is a critical component. And you're also uh, inducing the chloride for fungal resistance. Um, we challenge you and your customers to do three things. Do a full rate fungicide, whatever you choose to use. Do a gallon and a half of the KS178C and half rate fungicide. It's still going to be cheaper than full rate fungicide. And then just do uh, a gallon and a half of the 178C. Come up with the results. Let economics be your deciding factor. And, uh, unless you have a vomitoxin level infection in your cereal, this will work extremely well. At the vomitoxin formation, nothing's going to help you at that stage. And so if you get an early application of the 178C, even use it with your herbicides, uh, you get an early induction of chloride into that plant leaf and you'll probably get better uh, disease resistance as well. We're not promoting this at all as a fungicide, okay? It, it's, it's not, it's a fertilizer, it's plant health, it's making that plant healthy. It, it's, it's the same thing as if you get a, a cold or, or whatever. You take things to help mitigate 
the circumstances that you that you get from that cold. That is exactly the same thing. You're spraying chloride, which has 10 times or eight times, whatever it is, more chloride. So we're putting more chloride out there on that leaf to help mitigate the circumstances that is already there. And that's, you know, it's, it's plant health. It is not a fungicide. Now go, go to your supplier, your fungicide supplier, your local co-op, your rep from Bayer or BASF or for that matter, Dow Chemical. I, and, and I know this stuff because I'm a Dow Chemical retiree. And uh, I've been in the chemical industry for uh, eight years. One thing I've learned in that time period uh, is that you can't argue with the chemistry. Uh, you can try. But once the, once the pathway has been defined, there's no argument. It's just the way that it is. And, uh, ask them how their fungicide works. Give me a tell me what their response is. I'll just leave it at that. Lee? Here's some uh, plea tri a P trial that we did. Uh, the check uh, Praxer uh, there was at 54 bushel. Praxer plus 2075 increased it a couple. And then we had 2075 with three liters of 178C went at three more bushels. So um, it just, you know, that's, it, it tells kind of the truth right there. Like Jay said, try that fungicide half and half and then go to this straight 178C and see what you come up with. Here's canola uh, on Clearfield. Uh, the check is 55 with, with Lance. Uh, there is 56, and then we had 178C straight, went up to 68 bushel. This one was done on barley, <clears throat> um, and you can see the net return there in dollars uh, that we had. You can see the cost of the herbicides that we put down there, and then, of course, the yield on top. Um, herbicide only, herbicide with fungicide, herbicide with a gallon and a half of 2075, and then a gallon and a half of 178C, and then we had a uh, 178C, and then we had a product that we had, we, we took and had half the rate of chloride uh, in that product and uh, uh, took it up there and used it for a couple of years but we didn't see the results that we thought we might have uh, versus the 178C, which had twice the chloride. And then we had over on the clear on the right was 178C and then uh, a, another gallon and a half of 178C plus some 624 at the end. This was done on 300 acres up there on at, by Birch Hills, uh, another uh, plant that Florian put together. Um, you can see what his basic program up in the upper left-hand corner there uh, was. He sprayed half the field, was sprayed on 627 with uh, half a gallon of XRN with the herbicide. Then he come back on the other half of the field um, at, on uh, 620 and he sprayed a gallon and a half of 178C plus the herbicide. And then he come back on 720 uh, with a gallon and a half of 178C and a half liter of, um, of maximum plus two liters of, of Humi. There's your results there at the bottom, your yields and then uh, 12 and a half versus 14 or 13.4 protein and your fusarium levels. Other way, there we go. Uh, 178C and 2530, again, a wheat plot. Um, these, uh, these two were basically done the same there on the two on the right versus uh, the one on the left. 78 and 81 bushel. Here's another uh, hard red spring wheat. This was uh, North Battleford that we did this one. Uh, dollars at the bottom net after uh, expenses were out. So uh, you can look there at 13.1 versus 15.2. This was uh, Florian's uh, high yielding in 13. Um, he did uh, this plot here 
And there's what he did. Uh, he sprayed it with a half liter Roundup and a gallon and a half of 2075, come back after a couple weeks and done uh, relief, which was a micronutrient package. At the time, we didn't have ours registered up there uh, to, to go into Canada. And then he come back with a, or, or sprayed with the relief, a, a gallon and a half of 2075. And he come back for a third application at a gallon and a half of XRN. And uh, so there was the results on that. And then the next slide is uh, the DuPont uh, trial that he did. Those are uh, five different numbers there. Uh, there was the check at 43 again, and there was the different numbers, same program. And then he come back on the, uh, he didn't want anybody to think that it was, he was doing something different. So the next slide there, this one here, he went to three different quarters. Uh, away from the plot that he had, he went to three other different quarters and they averaged 76 bushel with the same program and 48 bushel on the check. This is a perfect example of, you know, he foliar fed three times. 16 bushel uh, uh, yield back in 2016, he foliar fed four times. The more you foliar feed, you're going to get. Now we understand that it's that it's expensive. No question about it. You got to run the sprayer over that field, but it pays for itself. And uh, like like I said, the the big yields of corn and soybeans and um, uh, canola, peas, wheat. Uh, the, that corn was foliar fed nine times. Uh, Dowdy's program with the uh, Soybeans was foliar fed seven times. Uh, the point is, the more you foliar feed, the better your results are going to be. If you foliar feed once, the only time you do it is at herbicide. You you don't have enough on to give you a result that you can take to the bank with. You've got to do it a minimum of two times and preferably three. So. Cut off your mute and ask questions when you've got them. Looks like we did all right, Jay, huh? I suppose. <laughs> Hello, guys. Hi there, it's Rick Manis calling. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good. I wasn't sure if the microphone was on or off. I caught only the latter part of the uh, of the uh, session. Unfortunately, I was tied up. But uh, I'm hoping that you have uh, something you can send me that I can watch again or a link. Oh uh, yeah, I, I uh, I'll send this presentation. I think Courtney probably has it on a flash drive. I can send this to her. And she can send it off to you. You bet. Okay. Is it is it something I can uh, just get a link to online, or is it uh, going to have to come by flash? No, I, I edited this one uh, to keep it shorter. Uh, one on Tuesday got a little lengthy, and so uh, I edited some of the uh, redundant slides out of it, and, uh, okay. and I send this to Courtney. Right. Okay. We're well, also. Pardon. Sorry, we're also recording this session, so I can also send that your way as well. Okay, that would be great. Perfect. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, this is Jason here. Hi, Jason. Yeah, uh, we were going to be using your your products this year uh, through Warren and uh, hello our, our program was uh, we we're going to be putting on some um, yeah. Yeah, hello we were going to be putting on uh, in furrow uh, your 624 uh, LS 624 put four yeah. gallons in furrow yeah, oh. yeah. Like yeah. Is somebody else talking sorry just a second I'm just gonna you done. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I say we're going to be using some of your products this year, um, and we're 
Well, I just wanted to go over you guys uh, to see what you guys uh, think about this program that we're going to try and do here or implement. We're going to start off with uh, four gallons of 624 in furrow with some uh, uh, biologicals going down and then we're going to put down some um, uh, boron, uh, about a half a gallon of boron in furrow as well and um, some humic on some stuff. Um, and then we're going to come back in and put on uh, a half a gallon of 624 and some uh, 2075 at the time of in, uh, in cropping. And then about fungicide timing, we'd come back in and put on another half a gallon of 624 and a gallon of 2075. What would your guys' thought be on that program? Late. Is this on canola? Uh, I would be doing it on, uh, we were going to put it on canola, derm, and lentils, and peas. Okay. Um, I may want to, I, I may switch you up a little bit on the peas. Um, and uh, I'm going to have to refresh, hang on a minute. Let's get refresh my memory on the peas. Seems like. Am I on, Courtney? Yes. Sorry, just a second, Warren. There you go, Warren. Hey, how you doing, Jason? Hey, Warren, I'm good. How are you today? Good. I think I think the program that we had discussed earlier on, for yep. maybe not all the crops, but for the, the second application. We're looking at some 178C in place of the 2075 at fungicide timing. Yeah, on peas, that's what I would uh, I would uh, refer to as well. You're thinking on uh, leg any legumes or just peas? But what about lentils? Any legumes. Uh, the reason yeah. is that they're particularly susceptible to to fungal attack. And in fact, any foliar that you did, even with uh, herbicide. Uh, I would I would lead more toward 178C than I would 2075. I mean, I love 2075 as a product, but you know, if you have a particularly wet year or you have the environmental conditions that are going to uh, promote fungal growth, that's what you have to keep in mind. If you're going to be dry during the and it looks like you're you're dry constantly. You probably are not have the kind of problem uh, with with fungal attack as you would if it's extremely wet. So you know, watch it. Um, yeah. Just keep that in mind. Okay. That's about right, Lee. What what yeah, I yeah, just yeah, Jason. Just be ready to switch horses in the race yeah. here. Yeah. You know, if if it's dry you know, uh, then the 178C maybe, or you could go 2075, but if it's wet, you have, you might even, and, and peas are, are really susceptible to fungal attack. So I, I guess if, if you have a wet season, it wouldn't be beyond me to, to even either up the rate of 178C or do a half rate of 178C and maybe some uh, half rate of fungicide in there. I, I'm I'm not ready to throw the fungicide out with the with the dishwasher or with the dishwater. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you know. So uh, just kind of watch what you're doing and, and whether how the year goes. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I, on that uh, the third application, if you were going to go with a third application through your canola. At what juncture would you be putting the third application on on the canola? I would put it on at uh, when you still had leaves you were in the last stages of deflowering. Okay. Um, you know when you had twenty percent flowers left, uh, where you the most important application is when you're just into twenty percent. When you got twenty percent leaves left that's where you're going to gain your weight stage, which okay. is valuable at that stage as well. Yeah. I, I would put on 1022 at that stage. I would, or, or a mixture of some yeah. sort of, uh, of, of uh, potassium and phosphate at that stage. Okay. Again, your, your strategy of in, 
infield mixing of 2075 or 178 C with a starter fertilizer is going to give you that FOSS that you need at that stage. Yeah. And Jason's going to have 624 J and, and Lee. Okay. In, in and that, to mix that, would, that would work. That would work. Okay. Okay, just wanted to just wanted to get their uh, input there as well, Warren. Just to, well, we've got the the powers of B on the screen here. You bet. Just so you, just Jay and Lee, just so you guys know, Jason is a brother of Jeff. Okay. Lyman and Weaver in there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that. Yep. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? No. And if you got any questions uh, that you can't think of now and you want to, just give a call. Um, Lee and I and David behind him, who's our development person, are always available. So. And why don't, I'll give him my number, 308-340-340. Uh, 5228 is my cell phone number, Jay. My cell phone number is 308 737 9755. David? 605 430 3720. <laughs> Well, we certainly like Perfect. to thank okay. you for coming and giving us the opportunity to our story. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much for coming, Jay and Lee and David. And thank you, everybody, for joining in on the call. Thank you for the information. You bet. <clears throat> Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.